to Antonino Forti, who is one of my most of my scholars. Now, a Buddhist cave decorated with meditation scenes at once makes perfect sense and no sense at all. It makes sense considering the central role of meditation in Buddhism. It makes no sense in that nowhere in Buddhist discourse do we find the instruction to use an extended pictorial program to guide one through meditation. Recent debate further galvanized the matter. To some, embellished caves have nothing to do with the meditation. To others, they do. The crux of the debate pivots around the relevance or irrelevance of meditation practice in relation to the cave murals. Here, however, I want to focus on cases where that practice is largely a mood issue, whereas the decorative program is the key. The meditation caves on Mount Vulture Peak um, serve as a good starting point. Faxian visited there and notes hundreds of cliffside caves on rocks where Buddha and his disciples once sat in meditation. A rock cavern in particular caught Faxian's attention. Quote, this is where Ananda was sitting in meditation when the Deva Mara, having assumed the form of large vulture, took his place in front of the cavern and frightened the disciple. Then Buddha, by his mysterious supernatural power, made a cleft in the rock, introduced his hand and struck Ananda's shoulder so that his fear immediately passed away. Fashion's report is materialized in Mingang Cave 38, ostensibly a meditation cave, but not so fast. Excavated high on the cliff, the cave is hardly accessible less than six feet in height inside. The cell would make a tough occupancy. One might say that this seclusion and inaccessibility is precisely the point, a perfect retreat from the madding crowd where one could meditate undisturbed beyond dealing with that vulture, a pain in the neck. Fair enough, but what about the relief sculpture inside the cave? What is it for? The program is a composite of a host of mignettes. Each of them can be aligned with some textual sources, but the composite whole has no textual source. What is the script that brings the disparate parts together? How do these parts add up? Take, for example, the set of six sculpture vignettes on the south wall. Except the vulture scene, all are pages taken from the playbook of Buddha's life yet their arrangement is odd. If we treat the entire wall as a linear narrative, we would not know where to begin, but let's give it a try anyway. The scenes do not fit into the linear order of Buddha's biography. Nevertheless, we can detect a suggestive pattern emerging from the arrangement. The pattern derives from some deliberate alignment of thematically related vignettes. Both the top scenes uh, pertain to routing either Mara or the unruly dragon in the fiery grotto. Both the bottom scenes um, are about meditation. The bottom right scene pertains to Bodhisattva Shakyamuni contemplating his eminent birth in the human world as a royal prince. The pair of pansy Bodhisattvas with their fingers touching their cheek are stock fig uh, figures signaling contemplation. Their presence reinforced the overall point here, that is meditation. The vignette is aligned with the meditating Ananda to the left. Both the middle scenes suggest passage. The wheel turning at Deer Park pertains, among other things, to ferrying the sentient beings to the other shore. The triple ladder links the heaven of 33 gods to Jambodiva, our world. Ananda meditating in the cave is not part of the standard Buddhist life story, hence particularly significant here. It stages a psychodrama of anxiety and overcoming. The, the fright attending occupancy of a dark cave 
is assuaged through Shakyamuni's gesture of reassurance and comfort. The fire grotto in the cave is not part of the, oh, the fire grotto at the top and encounter with the poisonous dragon is just as nerve wracking. Both the bottom and top cave scenes betray a continuous anxiety about cave occupancy. Why the anxiety? The middle scene offers clues. At the surface level, it re references an episode in Buddha's life after Buddha dazzles his audience with this supernatural paratonic show at Travesty, he ascends to the heaven of 33 gods to expound Abhidhamma to the celestials there, his mother included. His sudden departure and absence from Jambudviva caused anxiety among the earthlings. A likeness of him is made to satisfy people's yearning for him. Three months later, he descends to Jambudvipa at, um, through a triple ladder, eagerly awaited by a crowd there, vying for the first row to greet him. Among them is a nun named Utpalavana. Not to be shuffled behind the crowd, she manifests herself as a will-turning king. The ascent to heaven of 33 gods and the subsequent descent from, from it is a dry run of the eventual Parinirvana. All this makes sense in view of the patron family sentiment fully articulated in the lengthy dedicatory votive text inscribed above the cave entrance on this facade. I have translated whole in my book, uh, Shaping the Lotus Sutra. The triple ladder scene resonates well with the patron family's situation. The family has recently lost its son. Like the Shravasti townsfolk longing for Buddha's presence, the patron family laments the Buddha's passing and absence in this world. The mourning, needless to say, is in fact primarily for their deceased son. The Buddha's absence and by extension, the patron family's son's death prompts image making, much like the Shravast people creating a five foot tall likeness of the Buddha during his absence from the Jambudvipa. The patron families here prays for their son to ascend to the pure land. Accordingly, the triple ladder is conveniently, conveniently pressed into service there for the ascent to heaven. There's more to the triple ladder here. By Fa Xian's account, the ladder reaches to the yellow spring, Huangquan, underworld in Chinese imagination. The question then is how do these three vertically aligned scenes add up? The key con concept behind them is the ascent to heaven but in a Buddhist manner. According to Buddhist meditation scheme, the subject would progress through four meditative heavens in the realm of form in an out-of-body experience to reach the realm of the formless. Hence the fly uh, to heaven sequence starts with the me meditation in the cave, followed up by the triple ladder to heaven and capped with the fiery grotto scene at the top. But why the fire at the top? In the Buddha's biography, the Buddha enters the grotto to best the unruly dragon through a crossfire. That is, of course, the fictional spin. Symbolically, the fiery grotto visualized the fourth meditative state known as the fire concentration, Huo Ding, or flame samadhi, Huo Guang San Mei, resulting in bodily extinction. The practitioner attains the bodiless, ethereal, and celestial state of manifested body, not unlike immaculate conception known as, quote, attainment of the supreme way in the womb by way of formlessness. Thus, from the bottom to top, the three-stage sequence enacts a symbolic death and rebirth narrative. It starts with the postmodern spirit entering the cave, the Yellow Spring. It ends with the spirit's bodily extinction and the bodiless reconception in the celestial womb. This journey is an emotional roller coaster, starting with comforting the young spirit fearful of the unknown netherworld, 
and seeing him off at the triple ladder in the ascent to heaven. What happens here is part of a larger sculptural narrative that uh, fully maps out this death to reaper scenario. For those interested in, you might want to read my, uh, the chapter one of my book, Shaping the Little Suture, uh, to see how the entire postmodern fly to heaven scenario is played out in the rest of the cave. So back to the question, why decorate Buddhist caves shrine with the meditation schemes? We now Eugene, dive into- Eugene, let me, Eugene? Yes? Let me uh, mention that there are five minutes left. I don't know if yes. you can see the clock in the top right, but there, yes. there are less than five minutes left. Yeah, I, I think I'm, I should be fine. Okay. So, um, So now we dive into, well, we, we, we are actually diving into the cave uh, to find out the answer. And essentially there are two issues. One is meditation, another is death. So what do they have in common? Bodily extinction. In meditation, the subject progress through four meditative heavens of the realm of form to reach the formless realm. Likewise, death is about the loss of body, most palpable in cremation. Thus, bodily extinction makes it possible for medieval Chinese lay community to apply the meditation script to the care of the dead. The five samadhi, a meditative practice, can thus be easily transposed to the mortuary context to put a more exalted spin on the brute fact of death. Once the bodily state is achieved, it can be readily imagined as the attainment of xian or transcendence or in Chinese translation of Buddhist Sutra, quote, the formless conception, the womb, the attainment of the Supreme Way. In a way, Buddhist cave shrines continue the traditional pre-Buddhist um, memorial shrine. A shrine is typically paired with a tomb. The dai corresponds to the twofold structure of postmodern existence, the airborne Hun spirit and the earthbound poor spirit. Accordingly, the shrine anchors the untethered Hun spirit and the tomb houses the inert Po spirit. Small in size, these early memorial shrines nevertheless feature elaborate iconographic programs. Like our caves here, the sculptural program inside the shrine serves as a roadmap for the postmodern spirit's flight to heaven. The size of the shrine here provides a good object lesson it encompasses an antechamber and a recessed inner sanctuary, two and a half feet wide and less than two feet tall. The minuscule size belies the cosmic reach of the sculptural program inside it. Whatever human activities performed in the shrine does not alter the logic of the sculptural program. What matters is that the unknown world of the dead is hereby streamlined, ordered, and made predictable. This gives comfort to the patient family. The same holds true for our cave here. The deliberate sculptural program models the unfathomable postmodern universe into a navigable space. The postmodern spirit is expected to follow the prescribed roadmap. Assigned to ascend to heaven is thus a default route. The votive inscribed over the cave entrance is loud and clear. May the Wu family's son ascend to the pure land. Ascend it does, as seen in the ceiling relief, the spirit rides and quadruped, which disgorges an avatar of the rider into the inner ring of the blossoming flower. There, an inverted image of the entering figure emerges from the heart of the flower, holding the right foot of the rider. Cycles of life, body extinction, and ethereal reconception thus continue. The floral setting is the crux here. Buddhist literature envisions the reborn spirit typically in the lotus pond. It rarely, to my knowledge, ventures inside the flower's receptacle to visualize the conception scenario there. The Taoist meditation literature, in comparison, does get to that level of visualization. The floral matrix is conceived as the purple chamber, a physio-alchemical incubator where ethereal forms of life are generated. To reach that point, the adept withdraws to a secluded mountainside to practice purification. He sets up a ritual arena equipped with a talisman to guard against demons and beasts. In the center of the place, he builds a chamber of the elixir. 
once all the spatial temporal coordinates are set up, he kindles the fire, there goes the fire again, and meditates on the scenario in which he may fly as a mortal, have audience at the Popo Palace. All this happened as meditative acts. That Popo Palace appears to inform the ceiling relief in our cave. In any case, the meditative act of fly to heaven is here etched in stone in our cave. It carries the conviction that regardless of human presence here, the system once in place can be counted on to take effect. In our present day parlance, we would call it automation by way of algorithm. Here is an early intimation of computational art before our age of computation. Thank you. <laughs>